Hello, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. The criminal trials for Freedom Convoy organizers Tamar Leach and Chris Barber continued in Ottawa. The Alberta government may be invoking the Sovereignty Act this fall. Our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson will explain why. And Peter Gabriel, formerly of Genesis, is allowing a traveling theatre group to use some of his music in a production based on the life of a residential school survivor. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The criminal trials involving Freedom Convoy organizers Tamara Leach and Chris Barber continued in Ottawa. Today, the court heard recordings of several media conferences hosted by the pair. They took place in February of last year and had been live streamed on Facebook featuring Leach and other spokespeople taking questions from independent media organizations, including Bridge City News. The videos touch on how the protests put pressure on governments to change COVID-19 health measures how they expected police to respond, and their distrust of the mainstream media. The defense argued that the video should not be admitted as evidence. Barber and Leach are both facing mischief and counseling charges. The National Citizens' Inquiry will offer up details and recommendations on Thursday following its investigation into the federal government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Officials with the NCI say the interim report by the commissioners is urgent due to Ottawa's recent announcement that Health Canada's authorized the use of an updated Moderna vaccine for all Canadians over the age of six months. The recommendations will be discussed by the NCI's four independent commissioners and Bridge City News will have all of the details for you. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says our country needs to build millions of more homes by the year 2030 in order to restore affordability. The agency says Ontario makes up the bulk of the shortfall with a gap of 1.48 million. The supply issue is also worsening in Alberta, British Columbia and Quebec. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in London, Ontario to make a housing announcement on Wednesday. The PM who was there for his party's caucus retreat says creating affordable housing is a top priority for his government. He says his government has reached a $74 million agreement with London to fast track building more homes. Trudeau says the agreement is the first under the $4 billion housing accelerator fund that was launched in March of this year. Housing is a solvable problem and we're all going to solve it if we work together. Canada has done it before and we're going to do it again. It's also great to be here with Mayor Josh Morgan who knows we need to build more homes faster here in London but also right across the country it's because we're facing a shortage of housing right now. And that's why prices of homes have become far too high. It's not fair to young people who feel like cities are turning their backs on them. When housing is that ex expensive, young people feel like cities don't want them. They feel like they can't succeed. But if young people can't succeed in our cities, then where can they succeed? That's why we're addressing this. I mean, housing in big cities around the world has already become out of reach for many, many, many in places like New York, Paris, London, San Francisco. But we're not going to follow those examples. Now, the Alberta government also announced more support for affordable housing here in our province. Officials say they want to create safe, stable housing for those who need it the most. Today, I am announcing... Uh, that Alberta's government will be immediately providing 16 million more dollars to bring outdated affordable housing units back into use all across the province. Now, I want to be clear, this is new money. This is not money that was in budget uh, 2023, and it is on top of the already 94 million that we've already committed to provide in this year's budget for capital maintenance and renewable projects for affordable housing all across the province. Albertans may yet see the Sovereignty Act invoked this fall. That's according to our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson. He says it stems over fears of Ottawa implementing an emissions cap, which would then lead to production cuts in our oil and gas sectors. The federal government is going to, at some point, put in a cap on emissions from the oil and gas sector. And the, the question is whether or not that emissions cap is going to amount to a production cut. Um, the oil and gas sector says it almost certainly will lead to a production cut. Um, and, and this is obviously rather unpopular with Alberta's Conservatives. And so there is some talk, you know, among punditry and stuff like that, about whether or not this is the sort of thing that the Sovereignty Act might be used for. You know, it, it was, I think, always unlikely that the Sovereignty Act was going to be used for some sort of small potato policy files. Um, 
And But these do seem like the sort where they might try and do that. Mr. Tyler Dawson will also discuss how the provincial government is trying to get a handle on the recent E. coli outbreak in Calgary. He'll have details coming up after business news. Well, we enjoyed another beautiful summer day here in Lethbridge. Lots of clouds, but nice and warm. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, the sunshine and warm temperatures should remain with us the rest of the week and maybe into the weekend. Yes, and especially this weekend, Hal, when we'll be seeing highs of 27. Into Thursday, though, we'll take what we can get as far as the nice weather goes. High 21, mainly sunny. Tonight, though, maybe not as much clear sky with 30% chance of showers early this evening and a 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds from the west becoming light around midnight. But after that, lots of sunshine, and I'll be back later in the show to tell you all about that, Hal. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Communities across southern Alberta are about to see original Blackfoot names come back to life. A project aiming to resurrect the Indigenous language through the use of signage hopes the initiative will enrich the landscape, invite people to take an interest in the history in our region, and move closer towards reconciliation. Several economic development and tourism groups partnered with the Ghana Nation to fund the construction of these Blackfoot language signs. South Crow originally had the idea, and it was inspired by looking through <laughs> some old documents in the Raymond Alberta's museum. And we found an article from like the fifties or something where it was talking about how there's Blackfoot names for all of the names of our communities in different locations around Southern Alberta. And why wouldn't there be the Blackfoot people have lived here for thousands of years. Um, and that kind of tweaked in my brain because we work on regional tourism projects. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if those names were front and center and we knew what they meant. And so went and started having some conversation and we took it to council out on the blood drive. And we said, this is what we'd like to do. This is why we'd like to do it. What do you think? And uh, they were, they were, they were in. So we pooled our funds. We went out and got an extra grant and we put together our pilot project to uh, basically roll out signage across the region. The project will invite communities, businesses, and institutions across the region to apply for up to $2,000 towards the cost of sign construction for their location. More information can be found on our website, bridgecitynews.ca. A dance production based on the life of a residential school survivor is coming to Lethbridge on Friday evening. The show also has the blessing of the former singer of Genesis, Peter Gabriel, to incorporate a few of his songs. BCN's Micah Quinn sat down with staff from the production of New Blood to hear about the special evening. All these kids who are participating, their grandparents and parents went to residential school and they are playing their parents in the show. It's, it's quite powerful. So we just hope as many people will come out as possible. Deanne Birch, the director of New Blood, says the production tells the story of Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman. He is a former chief of Sixiga Nation. Sixiga Nation is just west of Strathmore, just off Highway Number One. It started 14, no, 10 years ago when I went to visit Reading on Stone Provincial Park. And I was just so moved by going on a trip of the pictographs. And the Blackfoot elder, she was a tour guide, and she told us many of the stories had been lost because when the Blackfoot people were put on reserves, they were no longer able to go back to the pictographs and learn of their history. And so it was my dance class that I was working with at the time, and we collaborated with the Blackfoot language class and their teacher, Eulalia Running Rabbit. And then one of the boys in the class, Hayden Yellow Old Woman, said, Mrs. Birch, you need to talk to my grandpa. And he gave me this little ripped up piece of paper with a phone number. And three days later, I found it when I was going through my laundry and I called it and it was Chief Vincent. And he invited me to Six Siga and he told me his story of going to residential school and his battle with addictions and his story of healing and becoming chief of his people. So we knew we had inspiration for a story there. Famous singer-songwriter Peter Gabriel sent in a video a few years ago giving his blessing to Birch to use songs from his album New Blood for the production. Gabriel said he was honoured to have such a special part in the show. I wrote a song, San Jacinto, which was sort of dealing with this issue. Um, and, you know, it ends with the words sort of hold the, hold the line. And I think... That's what you're doing with this project. New Blood will be playing at CASA on Friday evening at 7 p.m. For more information on the show, you can visit newblooddance.net. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Looks amazing. Well, it is now official. Cardston is no longer a dry town. 
Council voted 5-2 on Tuesday, passing a bylaw that alcohol can now be sold at restaurants and golf courses. The opening of liquor stores, however, is still prohibited in the town. Cardston has been booze-free since 1902. Mayor Maggie Cronin reacted to the vote. I want to say to my fellow councillors, thank you for the trust you have in a process. It's for you folks, it's not what you wanted. But yes, it might have a very changing effect on our town. We will not know until it happens. And do I have fears? I do. But I trust the people also. Back in 2014, two-thirds of Cardston Council voted against allowing the sale of alcohol in their town. RCMP and the Crows Nest Pass responded to a call about a break and enter at a business in Lundbrick. Now, prior to their arrival, police say during the B&E, the owner of the business got into an altercation with the suspects. One of the suspects pulled out a weapon, used it on the owner, who sustained minor injuries as a result. The two to three suspects then fled the scene with an undisclosed amount of cash prior to police arriving. Police are asking for witnesses to come forward to help with their investigation. If you saw anything that can help police, call the Crow's Nest Pass RCMP right away at 403-562-2867. Bikers from across southern Alberta will be getting together to give back in a very special way during the 42nd annual Toy Run this weekend. The event is a way to support the community through donations and toys, which go towards supporting local charities. The president of the Southern Alberta Biker says this initiative is very rewarding. When I got involved in the, in the biking community, I don't know, 30 some years ago, and you know, it, it had already been going for a number of years then, it, it's, it's something amazing. It's unbelievable to, to watch the people and see, see the support for it. To be able to be a part of something that has been going on for 42 years and is going str uh, as strong as it ever was is pretty rewarding. And to, to see the, you know, the, the, the effect it makes on the people that it benefits is, is really near and dear to my heart. The event gets underway with breakfast at Honkers Pub, followed by a parade and then a poker run. Organizers say everyone is welcome to join in the fun. A study from the University of Calgary is looking at the impact physical activity has on young people with cancer. Despite evidence of the benefits of exercise, kids often become inactive during treatment and there are currently no formalized exercise programs to support them. So the impact uh, intervention is a 12-week study where we get to work one-on-one -on -one with children and adolescents affected by either cancer or blood disease. Um, and with this intervention, we have the opportunity to work with them two to three times per week, meet online um, using the Zoom platform, and we have the opportunity to do a variety of different exercises or movements based on how the kids are feeling. So we're very fortunate with the study. We do have a physical activity protocol that has been developed by researchers and qualified exercise professionals within our lab. So there is a set protocol that we do follow as part of this study, um, but we do tailor it each day based on um, the abilities and how the kids are feeling. It depends on the day because we always go according to how I'm feeling, which is why I really liked it. Because we could do, even on the days where I'm like, where I was like, no, I'm not doing this, I still managed to do it that day because I found out I, I could do it that day. I think it's just doing it and knowing that I can do it that's the most rewarding. What a cutie. There are new calls for air filters and better ventilation in Canadian schools. Groups of parents across the country say they're worried about the flu, COVID-19 and RSV spreading in classes as the respiratory virus season begins. They're also concerned about wildfire smoke. While the Ontario government has brought in over 100,000 HEPA units, many parents and teachers there say the filters haven't made their way to the classrooms yet or are not being used. Federal Conservative MP Michael Chong is telling a committee of U.S. lawmakers about his experiences as a target of foreign interference by China. Chong says the U.S. and Canada should work closer together to confront and expose the tactics Beijing uses to attack Western democracies. Well, I think they need to be watching for a, the variety of tactics that PRC agents are, are conducting in democracies. Uh, this is a, a long-term game that they are playing. I think they're 
tactics such as targeting Chinese international students, for example, on university campuses by coaching them to interfere in, uh, to target other students who are standing up for the human rights of Tibetans and Uyghurs who are standing up for uh, democracy and human rights in Hong Kong under threat of, uh, of uh, removing their scholarships or are targeting their family back home. I think, uh, you know, I hope American lawmakers have information um, that I'm going to be talking about, about tactics such as uh, disinformation campaigns. You know, the Department of Foreign Affairs recently concluded that it was highly probable that the PRC was uh, conducting a disinformation campaign against me last May. Well, we had sunshine mixed with clouds today and nice and warm across much of southwestern Alberta, and that trend should continue. A full look at the weather pictures on deck. It was a beautiful day to take a walk around Henderson Lake or maybe a stroll through the Nikiyuko Japanese Garden here in Lethbridge. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, the sunshine and warm temperatures should be sticking around for a while. Yeah, it's actually just this evening we could see a bit of shower activity there. For the rest of the week, though, looking fairly clear skies until we get to uh, next week's. But high of 21 degrees on a Thursday. And then look at that for the weekend. High of 27 all the way across from Friday right through to Sunday. Mainly clear skies. Down to 20 on Monday and then down to 16 degrees uh, with a chance of showers next Tuesday as we round out that seven-day forecast. So average high for this time of year, 20 degrees. Average low, 5 degrees. 31 was our high temperature that was recorded back in 1996 and in 1970 we were sitting at minus five sun rose this morning at 704 sunset this evening at 749 giving us 12 hours and 45 minutes of a daylight now okay so on the west coast victoria tomorrow looking at sunshine fog patches disappearing uh, dissipating rather in the morning uh, looking at 22 but 17 the closer you go to that water uh, 21 for a high in vancouver sunny with fog patches 26 inland and that humidex still sitting at 28 tomorrow 19 for a high in edmonton there's a special air quality statement in effect widespread smoke tomorrow 30 percent chance of showers and 20 to 40 k winds in calgary tomorrow mainly sunny sky high of 19 degrees. As we get into the rest of the prairie, sunshine uh, in the morning in Saskatoon with increasing clouds throughout the afternoon. 30K winds, high of 18 degrees, 19 for a high in Regina, looking at mainly sunny skies, 30 to 50K winds, high of 24 degrees in Winnipeg, looking at a 60% chance of showers, risk of some thunderstorms, and 20 to 40K winds. As we get into central Canada, Toronto looking at mainly clear skies, a bit of a sun and cloud near noon though, 20 kilometer per hour winds, high of 21 degrees there, 80 18 rather in Ottawa looking at 30% chance of showers in the afternoon and Montreal sitting at 19 with partly cloudy skies as we get into Atlantic Canada let's talk about Hurricane Lee for a little bit here okay so it's still uh, looks like the, the Maritimes are still bracing as that hurricane moves across the Atlantic so Lee is now on its northward course towards the Maritime provinces and the state of Maine uh, this is a Saturday event for the strongest impacts with lingering weaker conditions on Sunday. So this hurricane is quite large now and it's expected to grow in size as it approaches. On the other hand, the intensity, which is based on the peak winds inside the storm, will be decreasing and is expected to be just below hurricane status when it passes just west of Yarmouth, North Nova Scotia. Uh, that's to happen Saturday afternoon. So this timing and location will likely change a bit over the next three days, but that's the latest that we have for you now. As for tomorrow, Fredericton looking at 10 to 15 millimeters of rain, still quite a bit of rain. Risk of a thunderstorm tomorrow, looking at a high of 19 degrees. Halifax also expecting quite a bit of rain, 10 to 20 millimeters. Risk of a thunderstorm late afternoon, high 21. 22 for a high in Charlottetown, looking at 2 to 4 millimeters of rain, also a risk of a thunderstorm. And St. John's looking at 60% chance of showers or drizzle in the afternoon. Foggy patches and 20 kilometer per hour wind. So there you have it, that is your forecast. French regulators have ordered Apple to stop selling the iPhone 12. They say it emits electromagnetic radiation levels that are above European standards for exposure. The company has disputed the findings and said the phones comply with regulations. The National Frequency Agency called on Apple to implement all available means to fix this malfunction for phones already in use. They say Apple should recall phones that have already been sold. The agency recently tested 141 cell phones and found that when iPhone 12 is held in hand or carried in pocket, its level of electromagnetic energy absorption is 5.74 watts per kilogram. 
That is higher than the EU standard of 4 watts per kilogram. Users of the iPhone 12 should be able to download an update that prevents radiation exposure from surpassing the limit. Do you remember the name SNC Lavinlin? The company embroiled in so much controversy tied to the Trudeau government? Well, it turns out the company is changing its name after 112 years. The new name for the engineering giant will be Atkins Realis. The rebrand follows 11 years marked by trouble with the law, including the Libya corruption scandal that tarnished its reputation and it's near the highest office of the Canadian government. Company officials also say a change is necessary due to lackluster earnings. They say the company also hopes to shed the cost backlog of over-budget rail contracts that has plagued it for many years. Stats Canada says the amount Canadians owe relative to how much they earn fell in the second quarter. The agency says disposable income outpaced the growth in debt and demand for mortgages fell. Household credit market debt as a proportion of household disposable income fell to 180.5%. That compared to 184.2% in the first quarter of the year. That amounts to $1.81 in credit market debt for every dollar of household disposable income in the second quarter. That is down from $1.84 in the first few months of this year. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 55 points on the day to finish at 20,278. The Dow was down 70 points to 34,575. The S&P 500 was up 5 on the day to 4467 and the Nasdaq was up 39 points to 13,813. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 2 cents to 8886 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 3 cents to 271 US. Gold was up 11 cents on the day to 1908.23 US an ounce and silver was down 23 cents to 2284 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $9.74 per bushel, barley's at $7.40, canola's at $17, and corn is at $9.02 per bushel. Live cattle October contract was down a dollar to $1.83.15. Feeder cattle were down a dollar eighty-three to $2.53.50, and lean hogs October contract was down a dollar thirty to $83.98. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $73.81 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says our country needs to build millions of more homes by the year 2030 in order to restore affordability. The agency says Ontario makes up the bulk of the shortfall with a gap of 1.48 million. The supply issue is also worsening in Alberta, British Columbia and Quebec. The Alberta government is dealing with an E. coli outbreak at 11 daycare centres in Calgary, which has infected 250 people, including 25 children who are in hospital. Our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson will have details for us shortly. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. And if you missed any of today's top local stories, be sure to check out our website, bridgecitynews.ca. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. For the first time ever, Lethbridge is having a 6th Street block party taking place Saturday, September 16th from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. and all are invited. This event is designed to showcase Southern Alberta's local businesses and talent, featuring a downtown Lethbridge business poker run, live entertainment, food vendors, an artisan market, and a kids and community zone containing bouncy castles, games, superheroes, and so much more. And if you'd like to help out, volunteers are still needed for various venues and general setup and takedown. Just visit lethbridgeblockparty.com slash volunteer to sign up. Do you have a heart to serve our community? The Lethbridge Soup Kitchen is looking for volunteers to help prepare, serve, and clean up after meals that are given every day. The Lethbridge Soup Kitchen's mission is to help alleviate the struggle of poverty for individuals and families who are poor, have very limited income, or just in need of a hot meal. They also desire to increase public awareness of the needs of the poor and homeless in Lethbridge. For information and to volunteer, visit lethbridgesoupkitchen.ca. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. A large E. coli outbreak at 11 daycare centres in Calgary has the government scrambling a bit to not only contain the outbreak, but to also tackle a bit of a communications crisis. 
Now to chat about this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who joins us once again from Edmonton. Tyler, there are around 250 people who are confirmed to have E. coli and around 25 kids in hospital, many needing blood transfusions and dialysis. Do we know for certain what caused this massive outbreak? We don't, not yet. Um, the, the best guess, and I mean, it's a relatively well-informed guess at this point, is that it came from a shared kitchen that a number of these facilities used. Um, so the government held sort of its first big press conference on, on this outbreak on Tuesday. Um, and the outbreak was, I believe, declared on September 4th, a week and a bit ago at any rate. And, and, and they said that, you know, they had a health inspection of this kitchen, found critical incidents, including pests, evidence of pests in the kitchen, which I believe were cockroaches, um, some sanitation things, stuff like that. So the, the public health team is doing this, like, it's quite a remarkable investigation, actually, when they lay it all out. You know, they, they're they taking samples of food that was at the, at the um, facility. They're taking samples of leftovers that had been served. They're interviewing people who fell ill for their food histories. They're interviewing people who did not fall ill for their food histories. And, you know, trying to sort of triangulate a bit on what actually might be the, the sort of ground zero, I guess, patient zero or, or whatever the, the food was that caused this uh, outbreak. Um, it is worth noting, I mean, a number of, as you mentioned, of the kids in hospital are, are really, really ill, um, quite seriously ill. There's been blood transfusions, a number are on IV fluids, just because, you know, so many fluids are um, coming back out, I suppose, to put it uh, a little delicately. Um, and, and so they're under sort of close monitoring in hospital. There's three blood work clinics that have been set up at health centers around Calgary for people that need regular blood testing on this. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big public health issue um, for starters. But the other side of this is, as you mentioned, the communications part. And, and that has to do basically with the fact that the government didn't have a press conference for about a week. Um, and as I said, it was a very robust press conference, lots and lots of information given. But the question did come up, you know, why did you wait a week? Why was it so long before there was a press conference? And and the the line that the government gave was, look, we've been communicating with the the parents and the families um, before, you know, the broader public. And there was a bit of a gaffe when Dr. Mark Joffe, the chief medical officer of health, said, you know, he didn't feel any urgency to sort of update the public. And of course, he immediately sort of had to walk that back in a statement after saying, you know, what I what I meant to say was, we we're prioritizing the people affected first. Um, so, you know, a little bit of a communications problem there. Um, the NDP is calling for, you know, sort of a broader inquiry into what went wrong on this. Um, but, you know, from from everything that the, the government said, the public health officials said, you know, they, they are most likely going to get to the bottom of this. Um, and hopefully everyone who's in hospital recovers and it uh, doesn't get any worse. Yeah, the Alberta NDP has called for a full investigation into this outbreak. But it looks like the wheels are already in motion in that regard. So that's good to see. Tyler, the province also moved to overhaul the bail system to prevent repeat offenders from doing some of those serious crimes. Officials say the first thing they're implementing is a dedicated urban crime prosecution unit. What will that really look like? Well, they're basically going to be focusing on sort of urban crime in Edmonton and Calgary, I believe. Um, and so that's going to be things like, say, drug houses. There are problem houses in certain neighborhoods. You know, these teams that ha will have sort of liaisons with the police and, and social services and things like that and really sort of focus on some of these, these particularly problematic um, issues. Now, all of this, of course, is coming in response to the sort of increased amount of crime that we're seeing across Alberta and cities, rural areas, and across the country as a whole as well. Um, so there's sort of three initiatives. You mentioned the first one, which is this, this prosecution unit. Um, the second one is they're going to eliminate what's what's been in place since 2017. And this is a triage protocol among Crown prosecutors. Now, back in 2016, the Supreme Court of Canada had a ruling called the Jordan decision. And what that did is it set a ceiling, basically, on how long it could take a person to go to trial. So if you're charged with a crime in September 2023, um, you basically have 18 months before that case needs to go to trial or 30 months. It sort of, you know, depends on, on the case. But, but you have a ceiling. The case needs to go to trial in this amount of time. And so in 2017, this triage protocol came in. And what it meant was that Crown prosecutors focused on the most serious, the most significant, the cases that they were most likely to secure convictions on. And then in the other cases, they might, for example, seek plea deals. Um, the sort of controversy over this is that, of course, that leads to fewer crimes being prosecuted because they're seeking plea deals, et cetera, et cetera. So if the government drops this, you know, they're, they're going to be 
prosecuting more crimes. That's the idea, that more crimes are going to go through the court system, lead to convictions perhaps, lead to more jail time perhaps. Um, the, the question is whether or not I think Crown attorney offices are well staffed enough, have the resources necessary to do this. Because of course, the more crimes you prosecute, the less attention, the less people there are to take on some of these more serious ones, the ones that are coming up against those Jordan deadlines. So that's going to be quite interesting to see, I think, how how um, the prosecution service across the province tackles that, how many more Crown prosecutors are going to be hired, what the funding is going to look like, so on and so forth. The third thing is also really interesting, and this is basically that Crown prosecutors have been told to seek detention, i.e. not let people out on bail for serious offenses unless there are some sort of bail conditions that can mitigate the risk to the public. It sounds logical. And, and you know it is, because the Crown Prosecutors Association, the group that represents Crown Prosecutors, came out on Tuesday and said, oh, well, this is what this is what we thought we've been doing all along. This has always been the policy. So it's a little bit unclear um, you know, what's happening with that one. But at any rate, this is a broader sort of attempt to tackle some of the the issues that we're seeing on the streets, whether that's, you know, people who are out on bail committing crimes again, things like that. Tyler, Premier Daniel Smith says Alberta will have carbon capture incentives developed by the end of November. Now, this should really encourage more technology development and the installation of that particular technology, will it not? That's the idea. Um, you know, carbon capture and storage is a really integral part of Alberta's sort of plan to get to net zero to, to reduce emissions over the next 25 years or so. And, it, and it's also, you know, going to be key if we're going to hit the Liberals sort of net zero deadline for the electricity grid, which I think is 2035, unless I'm completely blanking on that. So there, there's this desire to have some sort of tax credit incentive program to sort of develop these technologies to get them installed on power plants and, and whatnot. The other thing that's kind of interesting that's happening on this front is Alberta's in discussions with the federal government to see what sort of other mechanisms, other levers can be pulled um, to, to get this done. So there's this whole sort of working group that Alberta's uh, got with the federal government right now on some of these sort of energy things, you know, which is, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you know, they're, they're playing nice a little bit over here while still yelling at each other in public. Um, so that's just another, uh, I would say, component of these, these broader discussions, looking at some source of cooperation between, between the governments. So now the province is also negotiating with the federal government to get federal tax credits and incentives in line with what the province really wants to achieve? Yeah, that seems to be the case. You know, say Alberta offers a tax credit for carbon capture and storage. Well, maybe the federal government can, maybe there's some grant funding or a tax credit that the feds can offer as well to sort of, you know, further incentivize this sort of development. Now let's talk about uh, what happened in Quebec City recently at the recent Tory convention. Uh, delegates adopted a resolution to really support Canadian energy. That's good for us here in Alberta. That's not much of a surprise, but it's really nice for the oil and gas sector here. Sure. And, you know, the other thing is that I think it really contrasts the Conservative Party with the Liberal Party. Um, you know, an election I think needs to be held by 2025 could happen at, in theory any moment if the if Jagmeet Singh's New Democrats decide to, to jump ship. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, they basically said they're going to support oil and gas. You know, they're going to look at a, a very gradual transition towards renewables and, and the reduction of, of the use of fossil fuels, that sort of thing. And I think this resolution was very, very overwhelmingly passed. Um, so, so, you know, that's not a huge surprise. The Conservative Party has always been, I would say, a little more supportive of, of the oil and gas sector than the Trudeau Liberals, for sure. Um, but just interesting that, you know, that came up again. It's, it's not like it needed to come up again. Everyone in the Conservative Party is sort of on the same page on that one, I would say. But uh, nevertheless, still interesting that that was an issue that came up and, and a motion for, for a policy that was adopted by delegates at that convention. Let's talk about West Texas Intermediate for just a moment here, hovering over $80 U.S. a barrel. That could really help boost our bottom line here in the province. Could we potentially see any dividend checks like Ralph Bucks so many years ago? I don't know. You know, that does seem like the sort of thing that a populist premier like Daniel Smith might go in for. But, you know, I, I do think this government has a good number of spending priorities. Um, you know, if you look at their mental health and addictions file, for example, building treatment centers, hiring professionals, I mean, there's there's big expenditures, I think. I mean, there, there's no sort of easy way to get around it. This is a pretty big spending conservative government. So I, I think there's a lot of priorities that they're going to want to put money into. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, though, if we saw some more affordability measures. I, I don't know what those would look like, but that certainly wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, the fiscal update a couple weeks ago now, I think they'd said that they were looking at a $2.4 billion surplus. And, and with oil prices sort of 
seemingly on their way back up. You know, everyone in the industry is sort of predicting a, a strong finish to 2023. That that could boost um, some of the numbers that the Alberta government's looking at coming into budget season next year. And so, you know, you have to wonder where that money is going to go. Is it going to be affordability? Is it going to be some of these policy priorities? Um, is it going to be rebuilding the Heritage Savings Trust Fund? Is it going to be paying down debt? You know, it, right. in all likelihood, it's a, it's a combination of all those things, I would suspect. But um, certainly better than, you know, going back to the days of uh, what we were trading at negative prices not all that long ago. When I was chatting with a couple of ministers recently on BC and they said, yeah, their priority is paying down that debt. That's a big thing right now for this government. Now, Tyler, there's also some talk that Premier Daniel Smith may invoke the Sovereignty Act this fall over fears of a production or emissions cap by Ottawa, speaking of oil. Yeah, so, you know, there's some talk that there's going to be that the so I'll back up slightly um, the federal government is going to at some point put in a cap on emissions from the oil and gas sector and the the question is whether or not that emissions cap is going to amount to a production cut um, the oil and gas sector says it almost certainly will lead to a production cut um, and and this is obviously rather unpopular with Alberta's conservatives and so there is some talk you know among punditry and stuff like that about whether or not this is the sort of thing that the sovereignty act might be used for you know it was i think always unlikely that the sovereignty act was going to be used for some sort of small potato policy files um and but these do seem like the sort where they might try and do that so as, as we've talked about before you know the question is what does this actually look like if the sovereignty act is invoked if the motion is brought to the legislature and passed um what does that actually do and and primarily it seems to be that will forbid alberta government officials bureaucrats etc from cooperating with the federal government on these files. So does that do anything? Well, maybe, but also maybe not. You know, there's an awful lot the feds can just do on their own. They have their own bureaucrats and their own police force and their own whatever. So, it, but, you know, it, it's primarily, I would say, political if it goes down that road, you know, on, on some of the electricity grid stuff on this oil and gas emissions cap. Um, you know, there's probably a pretty strong political impetus for the for the UCP to go down this road. Um, but as we've always talked about, you know, the, the effect of this, I think, is very much up in the air. Let's circle back to the CPC policy convention, which took place in Quebec City recently. Tyler, another resolution creating some chatter around the water cooler is how an Alberta delegation proposed a policy to ban trans women from female sports teams, locker rooms and washrooms. Yeah, and you know what? It's interesting because the delegation that brought this forward was, I believe, from Edmonton Strathcona. So it's the UCP crew in, by like a pretty considerable margin, the most progressive riding in the country. Um, and that was also passed. You know, it was not without controversy, certainly. There were a number of delegates who spoke against that policy at the convention. Um, but, but the thing that I find very interesting about this is that it strikes me as likely that when the UCP holds their convention in November, there's going to be a number of policies along those same lines, whether that's questions of parental rights, whether that's transgender treatment, gender reassignment surgery, all those things. Um, and I suspect that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for Danielle Smith, who has always sort of tried to stay outside of these discussions when she was Wild Rose leader back in, you know, 2009 to 2012, that kind of era. Um, she sided with progressives during the gay straight alliance debates in that would have been, I think, 2014. So so her personal views are potentially a little bit out of step with with what some of the party's grassroots are, are almost certainly going to ask for. So, you know, the question is whether or not those motions are going to pass. And I think it's probably fair to say that if they come forward, they will. But then the question is whether or not they make it into a policy platform in some way. And of course, this was a problem that Jason Kenney ran into. He he sort of said that, no, look, like the buck stops with me. I'm not going to put in policy planks that I think are going to jeopardize our electoral fortunes. So it, it it has the potential to put Danielle Smith in a position where she's at odds with her, her party membership, I think. Um, so it's going to be very, very interesting to see how she negotiates that. Because even in, in recent weeks when this has come up in Saskatchewan and Ontario, New Brunswick, she's kind of said, look, this is an issue I don't want to politicize. And she sort of ev evaded the issue a little bit. So it, it, it's a very interesting and I think a little bit of a sticky file for her. Tyler, we only have about a minute left here, but I wanted to ask you about the Alberta NDP uh, they have a petition out at the moment to get universal health care coverage for prescription contraception. At the moment, birth control is only covered by insurance plans. But what happens if somebody doesn't have insurance? 
Yeah, well, then you, you just have to pay out of pocket for, for your birth control pills or IUD or, or whatever. So, you know, this is a relatively long standing um, sort of left wing position that there should be universal contraception, um, universal coverage for contraception. So it's quite interesting, you know, and and I don't remember them talking about this during the election. Maybe they did. But um, I, I kind of feel like maybe they should have made a bigger deal about it a few months ago. They might have swung a couple votes their way. He's our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton. Thanks for having me, Hal. Well, being a teenager can be a tough more than ever. They're experiencing anxiety, depression, bullying, and pressure just to fit in. Parents are also facing the challenges of how to properly relate with their children amidst all these issues. Our guest today is a psychologist, Katie Millar Weirig. She's also a former actress and top 10 Miss America contestant and a mother of five. And if that's not enough, she's also the author of a book called Becoming a Mean Teen Parenting a machine and it is available at the balancedmindproject.com. Welcome to Bridge City News, Katie. Great to have you on. Thank you. So happy to be here. Okay, you sound like such an accomplished person. I can't wait to dive into that. The title of your book too is it's very interesting and it sounds almost like it's about being a teen mom, but I believe it's actually about parenting kids through those awkward teen years, right? For sure. Yeah. You know, I think we can all attest that this is a challenging time of life and yeah. for parents and for teenagers. And so this book was, I had many clients come to me and have some issues, whether it was like behavioral or relational issues. And they would constantly ask like, what do I do to fix this behavior? And I learned through, through my professional practice and through time and, and my own parenting that most of these issues stem from deeper root issues. And often it is the relationship. And so this book, book really um, tries to get to the core parts of the relationship of what could be lacking that's causing the issues within your home so that you can fix those core parts and then the behaviors will start to resolve themselves. Oh, fascinating. I think many of us can relate and remember back to being an insecure teen. Uh, so let, like, maybe let's dive into your background here, Katie. Can you share a bit of your own story and how you got involved in beauty pageants and how these experiences sort of impacted your role as a mom? Yeah, so around 13 years old, my mom thought it would be fun for us to learn how movies were made. And so we went and were extras on the background of some movies like Disney Channel movies. A lot is filmed. I'm in Utah. And actually a lot of these um, industries are filmed in Utah. They have great tax laws. And so um, I was able to be an extra on it. Well, through that, I kind of got, I guess you could say, discovered. And for the next six years, I worked in the film industry. I was a regular on a WB series, did a lot of Disney movies, a lot of commercials. And during that time, I had a very... Um, interesting experience with what women, especially in entertainment, deal with and young women. And and then from there, I, I went and did the Miss America circuit and that was really fun. But once again, it showed me that, you know, my greatest contribution isn't probably through entertainment or through some of these things, but through strengthening the confidence of the people around me. And so I went in and got my degree. I have advanced degrees in neuroscience and psychology. And now I work exclusively with families and teenagers on building confidence, strengthening relationships, and particularly handling mental health issues like anxiety and depression. Oh my gosh. And I know that your book really dives into that as well as love languages. So we often hear that catchphrase, love languages thrown around, but it turns out it's not just for romantic couples, is it? So we all have them. We communicate them to everyone we love, including our, our immediate family members. So Katie, why is it so important for parents to understand their children's love languages? Yes, it is so important because our children are developing emotionally, physically, intellectually, spiritually. All of these things are happening in these formative years and their attachments, the way they attach to other people are being formed in the home starting as early as 
as birth. And so understanding how your child feels attached, how they feel loved, what they need to feel secure within the relationship will give them a very secure springboard to get them through their marriages in the future, their work life, all of these things. Because as we're seeing now, we didn't understand this, you know, 50 years ago. And we're seeing these pop-ups of seeing, of personality disorders and mental health crises. And we're seeing that a lot of it is stemming from attachment issues that the person dealt with in their youth, not because the parents necessarily were bad parents or anything. It's just, we didn't understand how important it was to really understand each person individually and fulfill those needs for them within our families. Okay. So you say attachment issues. Can you maybe dive into that a little bit more? Yeah. Just things like, um, like, you know, I know that narcissism is a big buzzword right now, but mm -hmm. even things like narcissism or bullying or depression, suicide, all of these things stem from not understanding who we are, where we belong and having a safe place. And so it causes people to act out. And so attachment issues is means that you at a de critically developmental age, did not get what you needed to make you feel secure. So you, you remain in a survival mode. And until you get those needs met, you will stay in a survival mode. And that survival mode can sometimes be acting out, hurting others, hurting yourself, um, emotionally detached, all of these things that we would never want on our children come from them not feeling secure. Now that's an extreme. Obviously, the majority of people aren't going to deal with that. But knowing how your child feels loved and making sure that those needs are met within the home can be one of the best things that you can do to build your child's self-confidence and get them the best opportunities for their future. Mm -hmm. So how can those attachment issues be, be met then? What's lacking so I think often in the home, children from their parents know that they are loved, but they don't necessarily know that they're liked. They don't feel wanted and needed. And so one thing that we really address, whether it's in my practice or in the book, is understanding exactly what they need. So you know the five love languages like touch, words of affirmation, service, quality time, all of these love languages. It's really understanding what your child needs so that you can get right in there. And so one of my child, it's funny, he loves gifts, which is kind of a hard one because we don't want to breed entitlement. And so <laughs> right. the last thing I want to do is be giving more gifts. But for him, even things like um, printing a picture of like a fun vacation that we took or something and then writing on the back, you look so handsome in this photo, or I really loved this time and, and like putting it under his pillow at night. And so that when he wakes up in the morning, he sees it, those little things to him make him feel so seen and so loved where with another child, if I did that, they'd look at it and be like, what? When what they want is just to go out and, you know, jump in the car and, 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 on errands with me or something. And so it's just understanding how those needs could be met because we often are baffled as parents when we raise our children and feel like we gave everything that we could to them. We sacrificed, we did all these things and we think, how could they not know how much I love them and how much I sacrificed? And oftentimes it's because the way we express love isn't the way they're feeling it. And so they haven't fully comprehended what we're giving them and how much we love them. And so it's not necessarily that there's a problem with the amount of love, it's just a problem with how we're communicating the love. Mm, so interesting. Okay, so you say that most bad behavior in teens stem from their insecurity. And, uh, you know, why are teens so insecure? I mean, we were all insecure as teenagers. You're still, you know, trying to find yourself. But it seems these days teens are dealing with so much more anxiety and depression than my generation ever was. So what do you think is going on here, Katie? You know, I, I think this may be unpopular and hard to hear, but one of the biggest changes between our generation to what we're seeing with our children is technology. It's social media, it's the internet, it's all of these things. And when you really think about it, the uh, many of their interactions are happening over social media, which are not accurate depiction of the person. Life. When, when I was young, if I didn't get invited somewhere, I just didn't know it. I maybe learned about it the next week and I said, oh, I wasn't there. I wonder why. It's not thrown in my face through posts and through, you know, all of this, this social grouping. And so it's very hard for our kids with social media, which is why I have partnered with Wait Until 8th, where, which is a foundation that encourages people to wait till 8th grade for a phone and then wait till at least 16, if not even 18 for social media accounts, just because it is so hard hard on their mental health. So that's number one. The second is that they do have a lack of relationships because of this technology. We think we have friends and we think we're involved and we're super connected. But when it really comes down to it, our teens are lacking some of that social 
um, manners that we learned from having to, you know, speak more face to face and doing things more in person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that confidence is lacking for them. And so everyone is surrounded by people, but nobody feels like they have a person and someone who really understands them. And I think we need to be very mindful about how we allow technology in our home, especially for our teenagers and our children. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's great to say wait till eight, but you know, you try implementing that in the home and like all their friends have got phones already, <laughs> you know, in, in grade school and then try to be the one person not on social media. Uh, you know, there's also those social pressures. We almost need the schools to jump on board with that and it just kind of society to follow almost that paradigm yes, shift. Exactly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us kind of grouped together and said, hey, all of our children's friends, let's all just set aside our phones. You know, all yeah. the parents decided together. And there have been some really wonderful things that have come out, like the introduction of the flip phone that doesn't allow for, you know, internet or watches where they can still communicate without having access to the internet. But um, yes, it is a battle that us parents are going to have to fight. It's a reality of raising children in this generation. Mm -hmm. But I think it needs to be one we need to be very intentional about and not let it happen to us, but decide how we're going to allow it to affect our family. Yeah, it's almost harder to be a parent these days too, as, as much as it's, it's hard to say that. But uh, your book mentions something, Katie, you say that one in five teens are depressed. So what's happening and what can we do about it? You know, this is a hard one because we don't know exactly the reason why we're seeing such a rise in depression. Technology is definitely a factor. We we know that there's so many things. We just went through a global pandemic that's also contributing. So there's a lot of contributing factors. I think regardless of what the cause is, the important thing is to recognize that it is a reality we have to deal with as much as we don't might not want to. And so we as parents need to be very um, educated ourselves on how to teach our children these tools starting now of what they can do when they start to feel these feelings of whether it's depression, anxiety, or um, unrealistic stress that we start now to, to see those things. And one thing I like to teach to my clients is that just like we taught our children to walk in or incrementally or talk or learn math, we need to teach our children incrementally how to deal with their stressors. And so when your child is stressed about a quiz at school or something like that, you might roll your eyes and say, that's such a dumb reason to be so upset, but recognize that just like it was hard to learn two plus two in the early days, they're learning how to manage their stress. If you can take every opportunity that might be small to teach them how to work through those feelings, then when the big things happen, they'll be more equipped to say, I've been here before, I can do it again. Because I think a lot of times these kids just don't have the tools that they need as soon as these big life events start. And because of that, it does trigger some serious anxiety and depression. Oh, wow. Uh, what role does faith play in guiding our teens to adopt healthy behavior and values? I think it's vital for all of us, you know, whether you're an adult, a child, a teenager, understanding that there's a higher power and understanding who you are and where you stand with God can be one of the best confidence builders. Now, of course, you know, when we are building confidence in our children, I know for us, we, we like to encourage our children to do like extracurriculars because I know that it can be a big confidence booster to be part of a team or have a talent that they feel like is their own. But really confidence comes, it's an innate thing that's given from God that your worth is eternal and your worth is without it is not dependent on anyone outside of you. It comes from God. And so if we can give them that faith and that understanding and who they are, then it can stand as the first foundation to their self-esteem. And then we as parents just build on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you say in your book that kindness is often lost in the home. What do you mean by that? It's so fascinating to see how well-mannered people are on the street and to people they don't know at the school. And then you get a little glimpse, if we could be a fly on the wall in many of these homes, you see that there's a lot of, you know, demeaning talking or um, no patience and just we, we assume the worst of each other. And often I have seen that people are unfortunately the meanest to their siblings or their parents, and yet they treat others with more respect. And so we really need to reverse that. Of course, I don't want my child to be mean to someone at school. Absolutely not. But I also need them to know that the home is the foundation of society. And we need to make sure that within our home, we are treating each other with respect because these are the people that will be with us 
forever. These are the people, these are your best friends for your life, or hopefully that's the goal. And so we as parents and siblings and need to be sure that we are encouraging more kindness in the home. And that starts with the parents and how we treat our children. Mm, absolutely. Uh, what are some of the core subjects parents need to talk with their teens about early on? Yes. So one of the best things you can do, as you're saying, is early on. That is the key word. We, If you can talk to your child before something's a problem, it will be so much easier than trying to backtrack. So some of the big things we need to talk about nice and early, sometimes even as early as 8, 10, 12, is dating, substances, um, technology, curfew, academic goals, and then their own personal goals. So if you're going to try to talk to your 16 year old about curfew, dating, boyfriends, girlfriends, those sorts of things, I guarantee they're already immersed and pulling them back from that is going to be a lot harder than talking to your 11 year old as they're starting in junior high and saying, Hey, as you go to junior high, you might have these experiences. Right. Here's what our home rules are. Here's how we'd like to handle these experiences. If you experience these, these things, come and talk to me and dad about them. And let's go through and talk how we can manage this. And it will be so much easier. It will also be easier to enact consequences when they do break rules because both of you will be on the same page mm -hmm. early on. And you're talking about it when you're not emotional, yeah. when you're not angry, there hasn't been an infraction already. And so I really encourage people to try to think what was hard for them during, you know, junior high, high school, those sorts of things, parents, what was hard for you? And then going about two years earlier and then sit down your child in just a controlled time, maybe take them out to lunch or just, you know, in the car and just introduce those topics before they become an issue. Okay. Well, with that said, any advice for parents who feel they maybe have already blown it with their teens and feel hopeless? You know, there, nothing is ever hopeless. And even if we feel like we've blown it, life is about experience. And even though, you know, we want to have our children have the most ideal childhood and ideal life, even those things that might have gone not according to plan still give your child valuable experience that they'll learn from and that they'll grow from and you learn from too. So we're all on this journey together. There's no way to foresee all of the things that could possibly be problematic. The fact that you even are desiring that you want to fix things shows that you're a fantastic parent and that things can be mended with time and with patience. Mm. Thanks so much for being with us today, Katie. Appreciate having you on. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Katie Millar Wehrig is the author of Becoming a Mean Teen Parenting Machine, available at thebalancedmindproject.com. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks so much for watching.